So today, I want to talk about something one of you wrote in yesterday, and I said I'd you know try to address it, and that's simply um, the talk, the topic of patience, but patience as a divine level of consciousness. So it's gonna, it's not, it's not the usual meaning of patience, and I'll explain that as we go. First, I want to mention that this world is a place of tests. The the very concept of mystics using like a form of being hung up on a cross, not not the cross, Jesus crucifixion, but uh, an, an X. Mystics used to do these initiations where they would be tied up there and go through visions, you know, and fasting and so on. The sun dance of the Native Americans, those are all symbols, those are all metaphors that this world tries to defeat you. This world that was made by the ego or is layered by the ego tries to defeat us. Defeat what? Well, we're divine beings. We're divine beings and it's trying to crucify us essentially so that we lose faith, so that we don't resurrect into higher consciousness. So that's what this world's about. It, you know, life is filled with tests. And and none of them are clearly, you know, not by accident. But but really behind all of our tests, one of the deepest themes behind the test is this. Will you keep faith? You mean faith in Jesus and, well, wait, faith in who you are. Because if you have faith in who you are, you will pass your tests. The only reason we fail our tests is when we have forgotten who we are. But what about the tests of other people who are annoying or hurtful or selfish or your children that are addicts and so on and so on? What about them? It's the same principle. They are testing you to lose faith in who they are. That doesn't mean I'm saying, don't forget, enable everybody. That's not what I'm saying. Because sometimes the best way we can affirm who they are is by telling them. We're not going to let the ego who they are not to dominate our conversations. You're allowed to say no. No to the ego within people. When I say trust people, I, I never mean trust the egos of some people or of people. You're trusting in the divinity of a person. I remember uh, St. Francis, there's a story about, he had kind of a, you know, here he was, I love everyone. I love, look at animals and oh, look at, you know, I just love, 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 love. And yet he had a major phobia about lepers. They kind of just grossed him out, like he had really visceral reactions to lepers. Your thing can be you know, addicts, your thing could be um, alcoholics, your things can be about loud people, hurtful people, whatever. Politicians, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Who are also sometimes loud and hurtful. You know, and they get a collection of those things. But um, St. Francis saw that this wasn't quite right. And he felt, obviously, he's going to feel guilty about that. But there's a moment where finally he sees a leper on the road and he goes over and hugs them and kisses them. He decides that's it. And he goes over and embraces them and hugs and kisses and he, he decided I'm going to get into the God mind where nothing matters. So he hugs and kisses this leper and so on and as he's doing so they say the person he was hugging disappeared except the robe he was holding. So now he's all of a sudden just holding this robe and then he fell to the ground because he realized it was Christ who manifested you know, in the form of somebody to say, let me test you. Let's, let's see how you're doing with that leper issue. <laughs> now, it's not that we're all, we all could claim that it's always Jesus as your partner who, who, who hurt you or as your parents who abuse you or whatever. We're not saying that they're always literally. See, the literal, he got the literal version that it was Jesus. Or sometimes there's been angels who have manifested. I've had that happen in my life. They manifest, they disappear. And you, wow, this is amazing. In France one time at the Mount, Mount Segur, uh, uh, you know, this amazing experience where these two gals appeared up on the top of the mountain where there was nobody but our group privately up there doing prayer. And, you know, you know these two gals, you know, the Marys, we called them, you know, but uh, these two gals that symbolized Magdalene, Magdalene and so on, you know, they appeared, they started talking to me, this amazingly deep conversation for a short while, and uh, they disappeared, you know, and everybody saw this, everybody saw that, we're, they were like, we're, we're those gals that Michael was talking to, and I said, 
I'm not going to tell you who they were. I'm going to tell you to go look for them because I knew they were gone. So magical things happen like that. But it's not always going to literally manifest as magic. It, what's more important is the metaphor, the deeper symbol, meaning that no, you know, sometimes the people that, that seem hurtful or obnoxious to us, they're not always literally Jesus and then some miraculous they disappear because that would make everybody start relying on the, the possibility that that's the case. You have to do deeper than that. You have to trust that it's not Jesus, but it's actually the Christ in that annoying person. That despite them being annoying, there's a Christ in them. Not, they're pretending to be annoying and it's really Jesus. I mean, that would be beautiful if you got that. But more importantly, is when it isn't Jesus, can you still trust that the Christ is in that person? That's why I've always said, just, just don't hate the person. I don't care who they are to you, man. Politicians included. Do not, in fact, refuse to hate them. In not refusing to hate them, you've been hooked by the ego. And in judging them, you're already gone. That's what it means. You're already judged yourself. You have already determined that you yourself aren't the very thing you can't see in them. So it's so important for us to, to recognize this and, and you know, realize that, that we, have to, we have to become the things we claim to be. Even at Unity of Sedona. You know, we made claims. This, this is amazing. And then we had to prove it by going through tests that would, people pushing and pulling, you know, tugging and, are, are you really as amazing? Can you guys really be so loving and this and that? And when we had to say no occasionally to people that were hurtful, for some people that was proof that we're not as loving. Because it takes really great souls to know the truth but respect the illusion. To know the truth of who you are, who I am, who these other people are in, in the world and sometimes hurtful, but respect the illusion which is, in this space, hurtfulness is not allowed. See? So we have something to live up to. People keep wanting to get something spiritually. They want to get something from the universe. They want to get more abundance or healing or whatever. You, the best way you can assure that you're going to get something is by being it. If I don't learn to be it, then it's actually not me. So now it's a passing thing. It comes and goes because it isn't me. The more I become that thing, the more real and solid and permanent it becomes. Is that making sense? All right. So one of the things we have to do when we're into this state of, okay, I, I want to change. I want to become. So St. Francis, I love, love, love. But his test was the leper to move from saying to being. But what's yours? And, and I have to say, you know, you're better off going, I'm, I'm small. I'm, I'm very small spiritually. I have no big claims. That way you won't get tested at all. You could play it safe. I mean, sometimes I'd recommend it. There are times in my life I'm thinking, oh God, let me just become very small spiritually, you know, or whatever. But once you wake up, you can't. You know, it's like, oh, fine. You know, you just kind of go along with it. And, and the tests, though, are never accidental. St. Francis's was his. Someone else would have had no problem with that, perhaps. But that was his. There's an interesting story. I don't know if you, if you know the guy, of the guy. Um, I think his name's um, it, it, Jim Caviezel, I think is how he pronounces his name. But Jim is the actor who played Jesus in The Passion of Christ. Now... You know, he, he's, he's a normal guy, an actor, dealing with life stuff. Probably a little extra spark of goodness somewhere in this guy all along. But this guy is, is just an actor or whatever, and he gets this call. And um, the guy says, hi, this is Mel. And he goes, Mel who? He goes, Mel Brooks. What do you mean, Mel who? This is Mel Gibson, and I want you to be in this movie. And I want you to play Jesus. And Jim Caviezel says, oh, wow. He said, I remember someone telling me when I was first launching into acting, the person said, there's a, a few things you must always remember as an actor. One of them, don't ever play Jesus. <laughs> Why? Well, there's all kinds of stereotyping, but, but what if you and I were going to play Jesus or some great character like that 
isn't it possible the universe is going to test you to see if you can hold that? Now, if, if you're small-minded and you're a, 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 the t type of an actor that can just contrive a role, which isn't a great actor, then you just play a role and it may not come to you. But if you're a great actor, a great actor tries to be the character. Now what about, forget acting, what about you and me? When we try to be more spiritual, you see what's going to happen? The universe is going to say, oh really? You know? Would you make a good pilot, Herod? Can I get a, a little nicer role? Oh, okay, how about one of the shepherds at the birth? Let's ramp it up. Where, how high do you want claim to go? Because if you make a claim, here it comes. The universe will say, and so it might be. We'll see. Testing you. So this guy says, you know, and Mel Gibson says, you know, I got to tell you, if you take the role, I need to tell you in advance, you could ruin your career. You might never work again. And he sat with that for a second. And he was silent because something happened in him. And he said, this is like a test. This is like a test in faith. He saw this as he's talking. So he was quiet and he was hearing something happening. He then said he heard Mel Gibson cover the phone saying he's not going to do it to somebody. Because the, the actor was silent. So Mel Gibson assumed that meant, uh-oh, we scared him. He's not going to do it. And he came back and he said, yeah, you know, the bottom line is, if my life were ruined, if my acting career were ruined because of playing such a role, so be it. He felt this inspiration. Now, during the filming, because there's filming, you always protect the actors. During the filming, there were scenes such as the lashes, right? And something had happened where they didn't have things quite measured out properly and the guys were supposed to use these whips for some of the shooting. Some of it was uh, um, done through uh, uh, technology, to fake. But some of the whipping was actually done on, on, on an object behind the actor. But they mismeasured and a couple of times the whip came around and took out over a foot of flesh in length. Okay, it's like, oh my God, you know, this, this intense pain. Then. Then they ask him, uh, uh, he's getting sick during the filming and he loses about 40 pounds. But now he's the weight that Jesus actually was. And then there's a, when they ask him to carry the cross, it was so heavy he dislocated a shoulder. You know, it's like I'm going, can anybody see this? I'm like, this is, this is almost funny, but it's amazing because what's happening is he's going through it. It's almost like a stigmata. You know, he's going through his own version of the test. And then, and then it gets even trippier because he's on the cross and the weather, the, they filmed it at a certain time of the day, it was freezing. So now he couldn't even get the words out when he's on the cross because he was dealing with uh, exposure and, and uh, hypothermia. Okay? And during this time, there's an actual storm that comes overhead and the thunder was shaking the ground. And each time it would startle him, it would re-dislocate his shoulder. And he was in so much pain, but nobody knows exactly that he's in all this pain. So, he's on the cross and he says, and then all of a sudden, he sees this flash of light come to him. And he said, and the people watching, the, the people, the actors on the ground watching, they actually saw this great light appear around him. Like, oh my God, this aurora, you know, this aura, boom. And, and it was supernatural, but it was also, he was struck by lightning while he was on the cross. God, it's, you know, like, you've got to be kidding me. So they get a medic up there, you know, and trying to, you know, check his heart. And he turns to the crew and they said, he said, he could die. We have to get him to the hospital. Gibson says, what do you think to the actor? And the actor says, because the actor, hypothermia, dislocation, total pain. He couldn't feel his, his face muscles because he was freezing. And the, the, the lightning. And he said, just keep filming. He said, because if I die, I'm ready. He had had so many spiritual experiences in this. But one of them was this. The tests were happening. This is 
you know, for all of us. The tests were happening. And he said, I learned how to pray because I was in so much pain and nobody knew. He said, I just kept going inside. And he kept seeing things and feeling things. So life tests us and it does what it does. But do we have the courage, you know, to do the right thing? Turn to God. Turn to Christ. Amazing. So, to me, it's a metaphor of life itself. It's strange that we walk around thinking so small. Things happen and don't happen and how inconvenient that is. You know, does anybody, I mean, this guy's going through hell filming a Jesus role. But be careful what you ask for. And I, I have such love and respect for this person. I mean, it's a film role, but you and I, this is us, guys. Whatever your test, the, the, the lepers, the filming, what is your test? The kids that don't kind of, you know, go the direction all the time or they get sick. Loved ones that pass away. Whatever it is, that's your test. And I'm not saying God is trying to like, I'm going to try and ruin your day to see if you're a good person. These are all completely proportionate to our consciousness. I can't be tested on this one if that's your issue and not mine. I will be tested by mine. And, and, and I think people forget that you are that much loved. And care. I mean, re remember in the Bible, not one bird falls from the sky without the awareness of spirit. It's all known. Everything is numbered. Everything is perfect. Everything is lined up just perfectly by our collective consciousness. And so, you know, you go out to your car and, and you got a dead battery. It's symbolic of something. And it's for you, not for us. But we can help you with it. Get you to, a, you know, jump the car, whatever, jump start the car. But, but man, that this is all connected. Everything so perfectly for a reason. And that actor had his list of things. But then he was playing the Christ role. So he has a list of anything Christy, you know, related to, to Christ, to be in that kind of pain. And he said, he's on the cross, and he said one thing that, that really startled him was that there were people who were there who were completely indifferent, just like at Jesus' crucifixion. There were people that were totally sympathetic, but nobody quite knew the pain he was in. Because people shut down. They don't know how to tune in and be, be one with everyone. And the recognition that we're all in this together. You know, my brother, my sister, how's it going? How can I help? And we're all so guarded about helping each other. It's the strangest thing. So Jesus goes through this, but he's telling us the grace to go through it. What is that called? Divine patience. Now, patience isn't the same as tolerance. Tolerance when you say, well, I probably have to tolerate your behavior or you. That's actually still a judgment that's falsely being forgiven. I'm going to tolerate you. Patience means that we actually understand there is a purpose to it all. Everything is connected. Even if I don't know how, everything is connected. So when we become prayerful and say, you know, Patience is a huge lesson, obviously. And when we become patient, when we step back and say, I'm willing to see more of what's happening here. And to say it another way, the third dimension is made up of laws. The, the main laws that actually create a third dimension. Time. You know of another one? Space. What's the third one? It's time, space, and patience. Why, why is patience in there with the others? Time represents the human world with limitation, time limits. That's the root chakra. Space, we start to get into the heart chakra. Opening, opening to space. And patience is the crown. Because it's a way of saying that even in the third dimensional world, there's a version of God here. 
Not God, God, just only God, a version of God. What is this version of God? Patience. Divine patience. So if you can get this, if you can hone in on divine patience, if you can practice divine patience, what it means is, despite the way things look, there's a reason for it. So time is a measure between the, the, the time of two events. So time is actually figured based on events, whether it's the movement of the sun or whatever. It's the, the measure of these events when they happen. Space is this, obviously the space between things happening. Is that making sense? Patience is actually the, the purpose behind whatever happened in time and space. So patience means I'm practicing a divine attribute in a world. Now, if you keep going back to patience, like tolerance, no. Patience means everything is connected. Time looks limiting. Space, even as vast as it can be, still would have some sort of a limit. Patience means there's a purpose to it all. Underneath it all, everything's connected. If you're a healer and you understand the body parts are all connected, it's called holistic. But everything is connected. There's, there's not just a, like a, 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 you know, a, a, fa a fascia in the body that connects organs and so on and so on. There's, there's an energy between all things, like the whole universe. Every cell is actually connected, but an invisible thread or energy, an invisible web kind of an energy between it all. So patience means everything is okay. Now, ignorance will say, Everything's in divine order, meaning I have no idea how this is going to work out, but I like to say things that comfort myself. <laughs> when you really understand it's in divine order, you become patient. Uh, a Course in Miracles, I have a quote I'm going to share with you from the Course. Because the patient can afford to be patient because they understand not that all things will eventually work out, that's kind of almost pessimistic, even though it sounds optimistic. They will eventually work out. True patience means they already have. We just don't know it yet. That's how confident you can be if you truly understand patience. It means I can afford to be patient because everything is fine. Everything is connected. Somehow, the people that are hurtful or being hurt, it's all going to be okay. In fact, it is okay. The Christ or divine in them cannot be hurt. The divine in the other people can't cause hurt. That's the level of patience. In the book of Revelation, there's a reference. The patience of the saints. Why in Revelation? You know, we're going to do an online course on Revelation in a couple of weeks. We're going to start. It's only a few weeks long, but amazing deep stuff. Possibly the deepest material we've ever had channeled. But why does it reference the, the patience of the saints? It's in reference to those who remain faithful through their tests. Know that you're going to go through the leper story and the crucifixion of the actor story. You're going to have your stuff, your kids or whatever it is, your partners, losses, loved ones, disease, aging, whatever it is. These are my tests. These are the things I'm going through. And all tests are the same. They're tests, tests in our patience, which the word patience is synonymous with true trust and faith. Patience. See, patience is not a tolerance word. It's a knowingness. So, patience of the saints. Endure your tests, we're being told. Endure your tests. Hang in there. This too shall pass. What will pass? The stuff that isn't real. Don't sweat it. Don't worry. Worry means, and when you try to be controlling, you know, overly planning everything in your day, overly, you know, worrying and obsessing, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have a conversation. And when I say this, they're going to say that. And I'll counter with this. That is not faith or patience. That is calculating, controlling, and it's based on fear and worry. Just in case God isn't watching or taking care of this, bless you. Just in case God isn't taking care of our situation financially, we got to be prepared. You know, waiting for a rainy day, which almost guarantees you're going to have one. 
patience, patience, patience that you're abundant. Okay, when? Tap, 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 your foot, you know. When? When am I going to see that? When am I going to see my, finally, where's my soulmate? Where's my this? We're assigning these tasks, expecting them now, but why? Because something in me is miserable, and I'm hoping something will make it feel better. So that we call prayer. But that's not true prayer. It's, it's, it's a start, but it's not true prayer. True prayer would be for patience. Guide me into the ability to know that even on the cross, Jesus said, into your hands I surrender all situations. You see? Into your hands. I mean, the ability to surrender. You know, you have a loved one, you know, they, they pass away. And, and that's, I mean, how do you get over that? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe in this lifetime you won't. But you can affirm that there is another way of experiencing this. There is another way of looking at this. Wishing things did happen, wishing things didn't happen, isn't actually practicing faith and trust and patience. And those are all synonymous. Faith, trust, patience. So A Course in Miracles says the following. Those who are certain of the outcome, and I changed only a couple of words for simplicity, those who are certain of the outcome can afford to wait without fear or worry. Patience tells us that the outcome is certain, at a time perhaps unknown to you thus far. The timing will be as right as the answer. In other words, the timing of something will be as perfect, if you trust, as the answer itself, which is also going to be perfect. And this is true for everything that happens now or in the future. The past, as well, held no mistakes, nothing that did not serve to benefit the world, as well as him to whom it seemed to happen. Perhaps it was not understood what happened at the time. Even so, a teacher of God means a miracle worker, someone that surrenders themselves to, to spirit, is willing to reconsider all past decisions if they are causing pain to anyone. So this is important because it's saying everything's perfect. Everything's fine. All lessons were somehow relevant for everybody. It does say, but even so, a, a follower of Christ consciousness and so on should still be willing to reconsider some past decisions. Be willing to own you've made poor, poor choices at times. If they're causing pain to anyone, that's a good way to know that may have slipped. Patience, though, is natural to those who trust, sure of the ultimate interpretation of all things in time. Notice the reference of time. Because time and space are kind of the gravity that pull us into the illusion. Patience frees us from it. Why? Because no matter what timing I expected something, patience tells me it's already here. No matter how distant I feel from another person in space, patience tells me we're one. Did that make sense? So no outcome already seen or yet to come can cause them any more fear or worry. Beautiful, isn't it? Patience. Or, because that word keeps tempting us to go into the tolerance interpretation, patience. <sighs> that somehow we're all connected. Somehow everything is all right. The great movie... Clark Gable from years, you know, God, an old, old movie called Strange Cargo. But one point to that story, it's a guy who, um, there's a penal colony, and these guys are planning a, a prison break. But a character walks into the story, walks into the movie, you know, he walks into the penal colony, and they're like, why would anybody break in? You know, this is, we're trying to break out. Who's this guy? And, and it's, it's Christ. <laughs> And he goes in there and he breaks out with them so that in the journey through the jungles on their escape, he's transforming each and every one of them. It's amazing. But at the end, I'm not going to give away all the great bits, but there's a, a point at the end where the, the last of the prisoners are on a boat trying to escape. And it's not an accident. The boat, the wa stormy water, and, and the, uh, the captain of the boat. He refers to, the Jesus guy refers to him as fisherman. So it's kind of like any of the apostles or, or Peter, whomever, right? So there's this point where the last of the convicts realizes that this is Jesus and has a transformation. 
And, and the fisherman, the captain of this boat, sees these experiences, sees these miracles. So he says to the Christ character, he says, so is everything going to be okay? And he turns to him and he says, everything is okay. Everything is all right. Not going to be. It's already perfect. And when you hear the word perfect, do not misinterpret it with some of us making the new age statements of it's all in perfect order, it's all perfect. Because they, they, they don't know what they're saying. They mean that even though everything stinks, somehow it's perfect. The Christ interpretation is beyond the world you think you see. That's where the perfection is. Not the garbage. I can't kick you in the leg and say, well, that was apparently in divine order, wasn't it? <laughs> You don't make divine order out of hurtfulness or ego. Ego has no intention of making the transition into light. It disappears when we stop choosing to defend ourselves for hurtful thoughts. So everything is all right means, isn't it amazing that not this is all right, it means despite what we think we see, underneath it, there's a holiness. So you look at a tree. Oh, clearly that's a nice symbol because it's beautiful and green. One day that tree is going to age and die, maybe become diseased. Now, is that okay? Well, it's part of nature, really. Would you like its disease? Would you like a disease crippling you? Because you're now saying it's okay for the tree. It's divine order. It's part of the cycles of life. No. Underneath what you think you see, the molecules that make up that tree, there is a pure light that you can't see because you're looking at the damn greenery. But underneath it, there's light. Just like we can let go of the shroud that covers it, and all of a sudden the tree bursts into light. That's what it means when you say it's all in divine order. That somewhere here, there's a divinity. But we're willing to say, isn't it funny? That in this moment I can't see it? That's prayer, real prayer. It's the prayer to acknowledge what I think I'm seeing and experiencing, like disease. And, and discomforts and whatever else. Yet saying, but somehow everything is okay. And I would like to get to know that other world that's okay. How? Well, what you do is wish you didn't have challenges and tests and just be in denial and kind of make believe in other world. No. By forgiving the one you see. And patience allows us to do that. Forgiveness means I'm going to do a process around this. Patience allows me to not even need to do the process. Because it already takes me to the other side. Where there is nothing left to forgive. Patience. Knowing that all is one. Meaning God. All is one with God. This world, it'll, it'll test and each of us in this room and watching online and people that aren't even watching, everybody's having their particular versions of tests. The person that's afraid of a dentist is going to end up getting scheduled this month to go to a dentist because it's one of their tests. Well, that's nothing compared to like a Jesus-y kind of test. I mean, that can't be true. The dentist, it's perfect for you if you have an issue with that. Trusting, getting a massage. Trusting someone touching your body if you've been violated, it's scary and it's a test. So see, just, just try it. Be willing to say, you know, I'm not going to be in denial anymore. The world, it's constantly... Now, don't make it a bad place, but life tests me on every imaginable level and particularly wherever my frailties are, my, you know, weaknesses, if you want to call it that. But once I go through those tests... I have two options. I can strengthen or I can shelter more, even more than I was. What do you, which one do you think you're supposed to be doing? So ask yourself, how do I get to this one? Don't tempt the world in a way of saying, I'm going through tests like Jesus, 40 days, 40 nights, and then he goes through, they say the devil came, which is, you know, the ego, whatever, but the devil comes and tests him. And it says, just jump off the cliff, and the angels will come and catch you because of the incredible being you are. So why does Jesus respond to some of those temptations in the desert? With lines like, don't tempt the Lord. It's like, don't waste my time. So don't go and do foolish things 
and, and expect, you know, like, okay, I'm supposed to be protected through this. You're supposed to learn not to do foolish things. Don't dive into a relationship. You know, somebody you met in a bar last night, and you've now known for a few hours, and you say, okay, Lord, this one's in your hands. I hope this works out. You know, God would have said, I said, don't go to the bar. <laughs> you know, I'm not condemning bars. I'm just using it as a metaphor, all right? <laughs> all right? But just imagine, like, everything. It's being told in your heart. When you're, when you're you know, making decisions, which include... Ultimately, all my decisions will, when I started a while ago, are saying, stating what I believe about myself. So when I make decisions of sort of bargaining away in relationship, you know, settling for dysfunctional relationships and codependence or whatever it is, you know, abuses, if I do that, what is that saying about me? So in other words, I had a test and in my test I determined, here's, here's my multiple choice. You have value, you have no value. And I checked no value in my decisions and actions. Now the universe is going to say, you, you know, just objectively, we have someone of no value, order up, you know, and then the order comes to match it. You, you asked for this particular thing. We're all, without realizing it, every day having these tests without realizing it. You had a test whether you're going to come here today or not and watch today. You have a test of, of the topic. It's Father's Day, you know, and so which some people celebrate. And it's like there's, that's not an accident either. We're talking about patience because it's an attribute of our divine Father, Mother, God. It's a righteous thing to be hearing about and learning today. But what do I do with it? At the end of the day, how do I come out in all this? And I would just say, man, just keep going. You know, there are times when the more you develop mastery kinds of consciousness, the faster you process, the quicker you know things, right? Some of you guys know that. So it happens automatically. It's just as you grow in consciousness, things tend to download and you integrate quicker and so on. It's beautiful. But you still have to practice patience because not everybody else will vibrate at that level and move at that speed. You're like, got it, let's go. And everybody else is like, no, 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 wait, what? Well, I just got this concept. Okay, what was it? Well, it was the way to Christ is through love. Okay, the... And you're like, yes, way to Christ is through love. Let's go. The way... And masters are like, oh my God. How did you know? I said it five times. You know, the way to Christ is through love. What, what do you mean by way? Of, and Christ, do you mean Jesus? It's like, kill me now. I'm, I, you know, is it possible that that's one reason Jesus is like, get me out of here? You know, because people just aren't keeping up with his vibes. So even becoming a master, you assign yourself with new tests of patience. You know, think about it. Your integrity might rise, obviously, but maybe some people that are business associates don't have that integrity. Now you have to, what am I going to do with this? I have to maybe say no to some family members. Not because you're like making a list. Uh, you know, Christy, non-Christy people, you're allowed in my life and you're not. It doesn't matter. The ones you don't allow, are, they're still a test. Because if you disallow them and hate them, you failed your test. Even if you pushed them away for your safety's sake, you, if you hate them, you still failed. You pushed them away, that's nice. That's not actually a boundary, that's a wall. A boundary and patience means I will not allow you to lose faith in who I am or who you are. I will hold faith in you when you lose faith in you. And that's why at times... I have had experiences where I say no, you know, to certain things and kind of, hey, no, back off a bit. And sometimes people around me get shocked because when that person wants another chance, I almost always will grant it. If it's sincere, you know, if it's sincere, and there's times when I've done that and, and got my hand bit, you know, it happens. But I would rather lean towards forgiving and get my hand bit once in a while than to lean towards not forgiving in a pseudo-safety. 
So love, love as much as we can. And oops, okay, got bit on that one. What can I learn from that? Remember, forgiveness involves don't hate them, look at what you can learn, and affirm their light despite their behavior. So practice it. Some of you, it'll be with partners. Some of you, it'll be with politicians. It doesn't take much to actually search your mind for someone to practice these things with. All you have to do is think politics. And, you know, even religious leaders at times. So just remember, patience, thank you. Patience. Not the usual kind. Patience, which is, I, I refuse to forget that everything's connected. And the connectedness is in God, not in ego. Ego, things are fragmented. In God, everything's connected. So when I decide to be patient, it's not a, a sort of a pseudo-act. It's a recognition that somehow everything is okay. And it's okay because underneath the illusion of not okay, everything's connected in God. My tests, even my tests, aren't real. They're just what seems to be happening now so that I can awaken to what is real. So our prayers can be, help me to see what I don't see. Help me to have faith even in that challenging person. Because underneath it all, God. And so when a person has forgotten who they are, they act out, guys. They act out. So what they're doing, I know it sounds hard to believe, is they're testing you. They're saying, I am close to you. I'm your relative, I'm your partner, I'm whatever. I'm close to you. And you seem to be growing in consciousness. Whether it's a spiritual consciousness or more like family, you know, if it could just be family, you believe, you know, tightness of family or whatever. Whatever is your belief, someone's going to test that belief. So they're going to act up, but what we don't realize is partly they're putting on the dressing, the dress, the clothes, the wardrobe of the character for you to pass your tests. They also have their own issues. I'm not saying they're, they're always saints dressed in the garb for you. They have their own lessons. But why are they in your eyes? Why are they in your face? Because your lesson is always, do I or do I not see the Christ in this person? And if it's anything but yes, today I have failed my test. Not to worry, because it'll come around again. In yet another person and another relationship. So why, why procrastinate on that? But even that becomes a lesson in patience. Because I see myself going, you know, why, why would people even want to drag this out? Patience, Michael. Because the, even that part of me, the spiritual part, can even start to be tested and tempted about patience. Well, now that we get it, let's all wake up. Oh, that's right. Despite the way it looks, people dragging their feet, karmically, codependently, addictively, and reincarnationally, you know, around and around. We'll just keep reincarnating again and again and again. Oh, that's all fine. I'm supposed to go, it's all good. See, it's still the lesson. And if we start to get a little angst, you know, like, but, 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 uh-oh, wait, someone is starting to worry. But I was praying for a new child, Abraham and Sarah. We're praying for a child. It's not happening. See, they lost faith demonstrated through their impatience and they had that lesson when they got it the child comes so you and I are wanting to create new things we want the funding to create a CD or DVD of some kind we're, we're wanting a partnership that could last for life and so on all of these things are happening in time because time is the crucifix as is space but patience says there's a purpose time space Crucifixion. One arm, one arm. Well, you know, one part of the cross, the other part of the cross. Patience says, it's okay. Despite what I think I see, patience. And then the stuff here doesn't seem to have the same grip or power that it once had. And again, I'm not saying you should enable behaviors. Sometimes that's how to get through to them. Nice, firm, no. Clarity. They need to hear that at times. Um, I got an email or a text from one of my daughters, probably the one that has had the most challenges with me and whatever, you know, the greatest tests. She said, you know, and I, 
you know, sometimes have gone years without hearing from her because she struggled a lot with stuff. I never hated her, and I looked what I can learn from these things, looked at what I can learn, and I affirmed the truth of who she is. She could split the other direction again, and I'm still right here. I don't buy in one direction or another. You hold center and you keep fit patience and faith. But anyway, she just said, Happy Father's Day. Father's Day. I want to say thanks for the things you gave us growing up. You always made Christmas a great day, and you always got me the best things. You paid attention to what I liked, and always gave me the cool stuff, electronics, music, science, and movies. Thank you for wanting to do that. You know, and I just replied and said, um, it was always my pleasure, and thank you very much for the message. But in that point, is, this is a challenged person in my life. You see what I'm saying? My response wasn't, oh my God, she loves me, oh my God, you know, I already knew that. But there's times when she wouldn't express that and express quite the contrary. No matter what they do, don't lose your faith in who you are and who they are. And don't think that I enabled it. There were times when I said, oh, is that what we're doing? Guess what? Don't contact me again until you come from a different place. And years went by. During those years, some people, oh, I could never do that, which is why you're messed up. You have to demonstrate a clarity beyond human comprehension. You can say, oh, no, but I love my kids and you don't. I don't care what you think. That too, I'll just hold center. And I'll know that as annoying as you are, I won't hate you. I'll learn what I can from your annoying statement. And I will affirm that there's a light in you. you know. But let people do as they may, but for me and mine, we will serve the living God. So just because you set a boundary doesn't mean you lack love for your child or your parent. But I've tried this. If that didn't work, maybe I could try a little of this. You're, you're just working with what you can, as long as you're coming from love. You still do what you can to bring it about. And sometimes it needs this, sometimes it needs that. But are you even open? Or do you want them to come to you and do it your way? That's not right. That's not healthy. And even if they did it, they would not be freely doing it. So how can I be the presence of God? How can I be father and mother to the world? How can I be father and mother to anybody around me? And not everybody can hear that. But that is because of ego. And this too shall pass. Please take a few centering breaths. Mm. Let's set aside all the stuff of life and of the world. And without hyper-thinking it, contriving it, let's just feel relaxed and open to letting the Divine Mother guide us, heal us, teach us, work with us, to see what we need to experience today. We've heard about patience in the truest sense of the word. We heard about life's tests. You want to play the role of being kind of Christed? You might expect tests to that caliber. But whatever level of opening I'm doing, that will bring its match in tests. So let's all take a moment and open our minds and let you, Holy Spirit, guide us. Show us the kinds of things in our life right now that are most likely our couple of primary tests. Bring to mind the people or the patterns or the incidents, the situations, the circumstances, whatever they are. Illness, aging, relationship, whatever it is. Where are the lepers of my life that St. Francis had? Be open. If something shows up, let's just accept that it's possible that it's one of our tests. Be fully aware of it. 
More than one, perhaps. More than one person, more than one situation, whatever it happens to be. Finances, bills to pay. In the old days, we might pray that these things be lifted from us. But Christ taught us, don't say, let this cup pass from me. Instead, ask Spirit to be with us while we go through it. So that our consciousness is raised to a level where it can't touch us. So imagine in this moment, with just a few breaths, we are filling up with the presence of divinity. A knowingness of oneness, divine patience, peace, wholeness, trust, oneness, bliss. Imagine we're filled up with that. And then look at the challenges again, whatever they seem to be. And then just take your time and ask yourself, if I hold this consciousness, if this is my intention to be a prosperous person, to be a loving, forgiving person, to be a good mom, dad, whatever titles come up, what would you like to be? And then ask yourself, in what way are those tests helping you to work certain muscles spiritually? In what way are those tests trying to detour you from holding that very consciousness you say you want to have? Because claiming you want to feel it to be it is different from choosing to be it. And to choose to be it means you'll go through the test and succeed. Take a moment to look at your life. What is the consciousness I'm trying to hold? What are the tests that are coming to me? In what ways am I failing? In what ways am I passing? And give that a moment. And we call upon the Holy Spirit of God to give us the strength, the clarity. God's always giving that anyway, so then why would we ask for it? We're asking for our <laughs> acceptance of the gifts, the powers that we need to pass through. Those tests. Give me strength, give me clarity, but of course, give me patience. So imagine, before we're closed, imagine what if you had divine patience as an attitude or attribute. You knew everything was somehow going to work out. Everyone eventually healed from the highest to the lowest, the left to the right. Everyone, somehow, divine patience tells me it's impossible for someone to be ill. So I affirm their wholeness. And imagine the gratitude that other people feel for you affirming their light even before they get it. It makes it easier for them to wake up when we already see them as being there. We hold a patient affirmation that they're going there. And so it is. Gradually stretch out. I pray that this has made sense. There are times during talks I'll say things like, is that making sense? Or, you know what I'm saying, and so on. That's my way of checking in and connecting. Okay? 
just like saying okay. It's a way of, of staying connected and staying in touch to make sure we're, we're all moving and grooving together.